you know what? Going up to them and trying an idea of where you'd like them to go, selling it as a pitch is okay. always going to is always going to work. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book Rise of the Film Entrepreneur: How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money-Making Business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome back to the show returning champion John Badham. How you doing, John? Okay, I could be like Rocky. Not, 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 turn around, turn around, exactly. Okay. Um, yeah, last time you were on the show, um, the tribe really loved our interview. Uh, you know, we went deep into your history and how you got into the business and down your filmography a bit. So, can you, for people who didn't listen to that first one, can you just tell a little bit about yourself? And I mean, I mean, you've you've been around the business a few years, so if you can just kind of talk a little bit about what you've done and and who you are. Okay, all right. Well, I I came out here in the middle '60s into Los Angeles from I was an escapee from the Yale Drama School. Uh, <laughs> And people said, "What? What do you? What do you have? You directed?" And I'd say theater, and they'd say, "Get out!" Uh, <laughs> nobody, nobody liked the idea. Theater? What's that? That's for weirdos. And so my first job was in the mailroom at Universal, and delivering mail with my two degrees from Yale. There I was. But then everybody else in the mailroom was in the same boat. Uh, and the thought of, you know, becoming a director at that point was just kind of ridiculous. It's like you're down at the, the bottom of the food chain, lower than whale poop, and <laughs> and you're you're going to be a director. Oh, lots of luck. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, I, I spent some time as a casting director at Universal. They eventually trained me for that and then got involved with some producers who let me start directing. Um and it's a television at Universal. And then my first movie was with uh, James Earl Jones and Billy D. Williams and Richard Pryor called Bingo Long Traveling All-Stars, which was about uh, a Negro baseball team back in the 1930s when the black people, you know, could not play with white teams and vice versa. But they could if they were barnstorming around the country. So that was kind of the history of that uh, of those teams where the players were so fabulous. They were much better than the white players, but nobody knew it. Right. Uh, that that movie actually, in a in a weird way, got me uh, Saturday Night Fever, which was which was the next movie that I was able to do, and and that tells its own story. Yeah, we, a, we went in oh. deep in, in, in how that entire phenomenon happened back in the day. So I was lucky to get to, you know, to make a lot of, you know, really good movies like War Games and uh, Blue Thunder and, and Short Circuit that uh, a lot of uh, people say they grew up with Short Circuit. Oh. How is number five? How is Johnny Five? Oh, my God. Short Circuit. Are you kidding me? When I saw I was in fifth, if I remember correctly, that's 85, 86, if I'm not mistaken, around that time that's period. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So I was in fifth grade. So I was, I don't know, 10, 9, 10 years old, 10, 11 years old, something like that. And when I saw Short Circuit, it my whole world changed. I was just like, I thought it was the coolest movie I've ever seen. I was just so enthralled with Johnny, Johnny Five. Um it was just so, it was so, it's so wonderful. And yeah, I mean, I grew up, you know, obviously you've heard this a thousand times. I grew up on your films. Point of No Return, yeah, Drop Zone, Nick of Time, War Games, Saturday Night Fever. I mean, I, I, I grew up watching a lot of the films. And it's so funny that your career started in television, then went into features, and then you've kind of gone back to television and, ha and, and kind of been playing in that, in that uh, ballpark for a while. That's right. And, and the business has been changing nonstop ever since I started in the mailroom. You know, <laughs> it's changed a bit. It's just uh, so different in so many ways. You, you know, take hours to go through all the, the stuff as we change from film to digital and the studio system disappeared. And, uh, you know, so many things now streaming has become such a big part of our lives so that the difference between film and television has vanished. I mean, it's not there anymore. And, and in the middle of this terrible pandemic that we have, 
you know, the movie business has almost completely vanished and it shows up now in places we never thought like our iPhone. We can we can stream the latest re- release of something. It's it's pretty it's pretty insane how you know, production is halted and and we could talk a little bit about like just I know everyone's talking about trying to get back to work here in Hollywood. Um, and there's, you know, there's TV shows waiting and there's movies waiting and everything, everybody's waiting. But at the end of the day, nobody really knows how to really do it. And, and it's, there's so much like, like right now, as, as we're recording this, we're still kind of in that first wave of the, of the virus. And now it's starting to come back. Um, and we're a few days away from July 4th. So now everything's shutting down where things were opening up or shutting down. So I think and Hollywood was like, oh, we're going to open back up. Well, now I don't know and what's going to happen. And there's just so much uncertainty. And there is no blockbuster season. Like This is the first summer without blockbusters in the movie theaters since 1975 when they were invented by Mr. This, Spielberg and Mr. Lucas. <laughs> that's right, since, since Jaws and Star Wars. Uh, right. Yeah, they've, they've gone away. There's going to be a hell of a, an avalanche of, of blockbusters when all this is over, I mean, I don't know. Everyone says it's coming out in the in, in the in the winter. I'm like, but there's only so many slots. <laughs> there's only so many right. weekends you can put out because they've pushed everything from the summer over. The movies that are finished and done are sitting on the shelf, plus whatever was in post that was going to go into the to the winter releases. So, uh, you know, I, I know I've heard a few of them are just holding off till next summer. Not the really big ones, but some other smaller studio uh, fair is waiting till next summer oh already. Oh my what, lord! It's that or lose or lose. So it's like okay, we could keep it and hold on to it on the books for for a year, or we could release it and maybe lose our shirts. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a crazy world. <laughs> oh, it's interesting that the the Disney movie about trolls. No, that was um, did, Universal. Yeah, it was Universal. Was that was Universal? Yeah. Oh, that's, okay, Universal mm-hmm. trolls. Okay, you're. I mean, apparently that did fabulously people were so desperate for something to to watch it's but it's interesting they, they, they bought it yeah they paid 20 bucks a pop for it at streaming but the difference is with uh, trolls it was at the moment it hit it was a family film it was you know it cost about 90 to 100 million dollars and it made about 100 million dollars plus whatever they're making now it's a perfect kind of storm film but i'd like to see that with a marvel film i'd like to see that with the next james bond i'd like to see that with you know, Wonder Woman, um, like let's these big 200 million plus dollar films. I'm curious to see what it does. I think there is potential for that world. I, I do think that, look, if Mike Tyson fights back in the day, we're pulling three, four hundred million dollars in, a, in a, a night from pay-per-view. Right. There, there is a potential for that to, you know, for the next big Marvel, like imagine Avengers. Uh, if Avengers came out right now, at twenty dollars a pop, I promise you that movie would probably make one hundred fifty, two hundred million dollars this weekend. I just right, right. I, I think it would, um, but it would be interesting. It will be the whole world is changing so rapidly; nobody knows what's going on. It's such an, a unique place in in time, specifically for our industry. And you've been in our industry for uh, a few a few a few years now, so you've seen things yeah, yeah, change. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, seen things change, but you got to keep up. I mean, you can't let you can't let things get ahead of you, or there's just no way of catching up. Yeah, and 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 one thing I love about watching your career is that you have kept up. You are working on, uh, you know, re, you know, as of as of this year, you've been working on, uh, television shows and you know, very very hip and happening uh, kind of fair out there. Uh, and, and, and it's amazing uh, to watch how you are continuing. You're an inspiration uh, to all directors out there that you are, you keep going and you keep making great work. Um, you know, after these years, it's, it's really uh, an inspiration to watch you. Well, it's fun doing it. That's the, that's the good part. If, if it can be fun doing it, then you're inspired to, to do more of it. I mean, just working on this show, uh, ABC uh, family show called Siren. Mm-hmm. You know, we're learning so much about how to do underwater photography and transforming normal human beings into mermaids and mermen and having it absolutely believable. It doesn't look like they put on some dumb suit 
Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's completely believable. And you think, this is a miracle. We, could, we couldn't have even thought about doing this like five years ago or ten years ago. And, and it's so marvelous to see, uh, you know, if we can imagine it, we can do it nowadays, which is quite, quite something. Would you agree that that the, the the you already said it the line between television and films are starting to blur a bit, but I'm I'm noticing just from my point of view that the technology that's happening in television right now is so exciting, specifically like in the Mandalorian with the volume and and all the things that they're doing, they're starting to create very high end looks and 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 um. A budget look, you know, a production value at a very low cost. And I think that as this whole industry starts to shift, as we are shifting right now, the $250 million plus film, you know, might become a little bit more extinct because it's just financially, with, like right now we have no movie theaters. So is there a business model that makes sense for a $250 million plus film without a theatrical release? Uh, as we start shifting more towards streaming and, and moving towards that world, uh, I, I feel that a lot of filmmaking is there's t- they're taking from television now as opposed to television taking from filmmaking as far as as far as cost is concerned and quality correct yeah well I mean the Mandalorian is just like another almost quantum leap forward it was strangely with history way going way back to the very beginning of film where rear projection yeah. was was the standard of doing things mm-hmm. you know and then it became outmoded and turned into blue screen then sodium screen and green screen and all these different screens but now there we are right back because they could invent these giant led screens <laughs> so you get what you see is what you get you know you you have this marvelous stuff and and you probably don't have to move the camera around very much at all because you just keep moving the background, changing it, changing things around. And what I saw from the – there's a behind-the-scenes series on Disney Plus explaining the technology is now with the – the camera talks to the background. So as the camera moves in, in, in real space, the perspective changes only in the view of the camera. So you could see if you're just standing behind watching this whole thing, you just see the focus change. You see the perspective change. So it's like you're on a real – location it's it's mind-blowing it really is right absolutely it's a, it's a youtube video isn't it that explains all of that there's That's a couple a there's a couple of, yeah there's a couple of that and then there's a series on disney plus that explains the entire making of the mandalorian uh, as well right. which is which is wonderful um but so today i wanted to talk about um acting and and dealing with actors and how you direct actors because you have obviously such an experience with it um, what are the major differences between directing um, actors and specifically, but uh, in general, directing television, streaming versus feature films? There's no difference. <laughs> okay. Next question. There's no difference. <laughs> There's no difference. You have you have the same problems in both in both places. Uh, you've got all kinds of stories. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no single kind of story in either field. And actors are coming in and acting, directing actors 101, the first thing that you have to do with them in wherever is to make them feel comfortable and and make them feel relaxed. So many of our directors don't know how to do that. They're so focused on the camera angles, the lighting, you know, the shooting that they don't take the time to get, you know, this delicate, you know, nervous actor who's coming in, bearing his guts in front of everybody uh, and, and needing to know that they've got somebody there that's got their back, their front, you know, is there supporting them. You're the coach uh, and, and you're, there for, you're there for them. So that's, that's the very first thing that you have to do, and that's going to apply where, wherever. Um, I mean, I teach all of my all of my students that the first thing they do when they get to the set in the morning is they find the actor wherever they are uh, and talk to them about that day's work. Not something that takes very long at all. It's easy to do. But there's that actor sitting in the makeup chair or something just fretting and nervous about what today's scene is going to be like, especially the poor day players and the people who are there for 
just a short while. I mean, they they need the most help at all. The guys who are the leads in the show, they're they're pretty suave and savvy, and they know what's going on. But they still need direction. They still, you know, they, they still look at you at the end of takes and go, "How was it? How was it?" And when they look over and they see you just talking to the cameraman, or the boom operator, or the IT technician, they think, "Well, he doesn't give a damn about us," uh, and 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 they, you know, they lose confidence and the morale goes down. So this is a huge part of it. It's it's um, you know, it's like chapter one in the directing book. No, and so people say, "Oh, yeah, that's easy." That's easy, and then they forget and just don't do it. And just start talking to the cameraman about how about a cool low angle with a five millimeter. Right, so there is no such thing as a five millimeter lens. Yeah, but what if there were? <laughs> exactly. Well, then, what, so what does that first conversation with an actor about his or her character look like? Like, what? How, how does that go when you're approaching not in television, but let's say in a feature film experience process? Um, you're walking up to the actor for the first time, talking to them about their character. How does that conversation go? How do you how do you see this guy? What do you, what do you think about this character? Uh, d- d- tell me about him. Oh, that's interesting. Now, just for a moment, imagine that some god awful idea is coming out of the actor's mouth. Usually not. They they're bright. They're smart. You cast them right. They're not going to come out and tell you crazy things, though Marlon Brando used to do it just to screw with you. Uh, <laughs> did you ever get a chance to work? Uh, with Mar- did you ever get a chance to work with Marlon Brando? No, but my my good friend Richard Donner oh. directed him in in the Superman. Yeah, sure. And, and John Frankenheimer, John Frankenheimer got to direct him in the Island of Doctor Moreau. Uh-huh. So I've heard some. Some stories, and and he just liked to mess with people just to see if the director knew anything or just to entertain himself, you know, just get bored sitting around sets, being you know one of the greatest actors in the world and being asked to do crap. Uh, so, uh, so he just liked to mess with the directors. Um, but but if the actor is coming to you and and the idea that they're they're putting forward is just awful. Uh, uh, the the way to come back to them is to say, not that's a terrible idea or that's not what we're going to do. It's to say, wow, I never thought of it that way. Tell me more. I want to hear more about this stuff. And you know that the actors has spent some time thinking about their character and what they have. Let them get a chance to get it out. Let them get it out. Of, if If you don't let them get it out of their system, it's going to be in there just causing trouble. And mm. and whereas once, you know, you share ideas, and this goes down to even discussing how the scene is going to be blocked, you know, and how this moment is going to be. You know, you're you're always listening. You have to train your, your listening genes to, uh, to be paying attention and not to be selling your own ideas uh, as much as giving the actor a chance to kind of catch up with you and see what they've been thinking about. Because, uh, gosh, guess what? They might actually have a good idea. <laughs> and if they don't have a good idea, if they have a terrible idea, you can usually start to work around it. Uh, if you ignore it, it'll just come back and bite you. So, you know, bonding with your actors, making a good relationship with them right off the bat and, and so on. Because so many, so many actors just don't trust directors at all. Mm -hmm. They, they've, they've been manhandled and ignored and directors are afraid of them, hide in video village, you know, behind, behind a bunch of displays and, have the headphones on, which never come off. Um, and and I, I learned from Sidney Lumet, you know, who's, who, who says in his book, after That's... every take, after every take, I run over to every single actor in the in the take in the scene and give them, you know, a little bit of a note or pat on the back, you know, a wink, just something real quickly. He says, we never lose any time. I shoot my movies in 30 days. 
you know, so it can't take any time to do it. But it definitely, you know, lets the actor know that you're you're thinking about them, you're watching them, you know, you're encouraging them. And it makes a big difference. You know, when I read that, I said, oh, my God, that's going to take so much time. But <laughs> what the hell is it's Sidney Lumet. I should be listening. Right. Uh, <laughs> right. I, I can try this. This is uh, this is not Jaime Uncle Schwartz, the 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 crap director. Uh, so I started doing I going, you know, this only takes a few seconds. This is really easy. And the actors really appreciate it. They appreciate it when you listen to them and take advantage of their process um, and and not be afraid of them. Very. So let me ask you. So in your career, you have worked with a couple of movie stars um, over the course of the, of your career. So how do you direct a Johnny Depp um, or you know a Wesley Snipes at the height of his career, or you know the or these you know Christopher Walken? Like how do you how do you direct movie stars like that? Well, you've got to sit and and have conversations with them. Sidney Pollack. Uh, talk to me about how he rehearses with with Redford or Streisand or so many of the stars that he, you know Pacino, uh, and how how does he work with them? And it's to spend. He says I'll get you know Redford up to my place for a weekend and we'll just sit and hang out and sort of talk about the character and so on. I don't necessarily get them together with the other actors because I like that freshness of them confronting each other they're trained and so on they're pretty good at it but uh you know i get their i get their thoughts i get us on the same page i don't want to get to the set and find out that we see the character totally differently now if we're on the same page for that um i'm i'm just trying to help them maximize what they're doing and give them give them encouragement and give them the room to play. That's really important. You know, we remember that we we call actors players, mm -hmm. and there's a good reason for that. You know, they need to be in a relaxed, playful state. And Anne Bancroft said to me, you know, I, what I like coming to the set here is nobody yells at me before I've had a chance to show what I can do. And do you uh, and, do you recommend letting the the actor and this is general, not movie star and all that, but do you let them do you recommend just letting them go for a take or two and see where they come up with? Because I, I found personally in my career that they, when I do that, I find there's magic there, uh, and sometimes absolutely. they and sometimes they go off off the rails, and that's where you you pull them back in. But generally speaking, do you recommend letting them go for a bit and then honing them down to where you might want them? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when I'm staging, they, I get so much of their input coming back. I may say to somebody, OK, well, come in from that door over there and walk over to the desk. But that's all I'm going to tell them. I'm going to let them figure the rest out because so much of it is I'm relying on their instinct as actors. And I have a plan in my back pocket. If everybody came in drunk, hung over, you know, brain dead. I could block that scene, no problem, but I wouldn't get the advantage of their feedback. But uh, so, so I come in totally prepared and also prepared to totally forget everything I prepared and being willing to just say, that's okay, a better idea came up. It's all right. But if nobody has an idea, I've thought through it enough so that I'm not blindsided. And... The same goes for now once they're performing the scene and they're doing they're doing the takes. Let them go. Let's see where they're going. Uh, or if you didn't get a chance to do that uh, and, and they were tied down to a certain way of doing it, you can absolutely freshen the scene up by saying, do it completely the opposite. This is, you know, play this as a comedy instead of, Instead of a tragedy, let's let's shake the scene up here, you know, or do something completely different that you'd like to do. You know, the, we can't I'll, I'll say there's no way we can screw this up because we've got some good takes here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 
So it's it's not going to hurt if you can try anything that you like. Okay. And and uh, sometimes it, they say, oh, great. Thank you so much. And it comes out exactly the same. But that's OK. <laughs> they appreciate. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> they, they, they appreciate it, you know. Oh, was that better? Oh, yeah, right. It was really good. Uh, oh, so much better. So much so better. So much better. <laughs> Man, I'm glad we did that. Okay, let's move it on. Let's move on to the next setup. <laughs> move on. Don't don't publish what we just said here. Then we let the secret out of the bag. Your <laughs> actors are going to be pissed off forever. I you know knows, I couldn't trust that son of a bitch. <laughs> well, you know what? I'll tell you what. When I when I'm editing, a lot of times I ha used to have clients behind me, and when I'm editing a movie, they're like, "Can you can you move it over for like five frames here, or ten frames there?" And I'm like, "Sure." And I wouldn't do it, and I would play it back again. They're like, "Is that better?" They're like, "Oh yeah, so much better." I'm like, "Yeah, I know." I know. <laughs> Old editor trick. <laughs> oh, it's great. Great. Absolutely. One of one of the best tricks ever. <laughs> now, um uh, how do you how do you how do why do directors get tested by their actors? Cuz a lot of times depending on where the actor is emotionally, um, especially if they don't know you and you haven't built that relationship up, uh, that relationship up, They'll test you, like Mr. Brando, um, but that's a, an extreme case. Um, but a lot of times I've, I've found in my career as well that actors will test you to see if you know what you're doing. Um, what's your experience with that, and how do you deal with that? Well, uh, hopefully hopefully you know enough about the script and, and the scenes that you're doing that, that you can be uh, conversant with that. What you don't want to happen is having them ask you questions that you don't know the answers to because you haven't prepared and you're faking it all the way through. And, and they're looking for somebody they can lean on and trust who's going to give them a little feedback, you know, was that good and has some sense of taste. So they're, they're constantly watching that. And I'm talking about more experienced actors. The, the beginning actors tend to be much more malleable because they don't know quite enough and they don't know who to trust. But the experienced, experienced ones are going, am I going to pay any attention to this guy? Or am I just going to, I'm just got to hang in there and do it, do it by myself. Um, and, and that you don't, you don't know until you get involved with, with the actor and just see uh, how they're, how they're responding to you and how you can, can be helpful especially in television, you know, you, you cannot go and tell one of the leading actors about their character. They know about their character better than you'll ever know about their character. What you can tell them is, uh, you know, here's, here's a slightly different way to approach this scene. Let's, let's, uh, let's try to uh, make your objective to, to sell the other character, to persuade the other character that you you want them to do something in particular as opposed to the way you're doing it now so you give them different verbs and active verbs is one of the the real good tricks that you have to learn that an, an actor will say give me a verb give me a better verb uh, uh sell persuade is not working how about seduce seduce i can do seduce okay let me have it yeah, so uh, I find that to be an issue with a lot of first-time directors or, or younger directors or inexperienced directors where you're at, you're right that a lot of times they'll they'll try to like either, God forbid, give them a, re a line reading or, or like try to be on the nose with kind of like try to like micromanage the performance. And that's very difficult for an actor to do. Whereas if you just say, instead of saying, okay, I want you to do this and then I want you to do this with your words and that, you can't do that with an actor from my point of view. But no. you, but what you just said is brilliant. Just like, I want you to seduce him or I want you to seduce her in the way you're talking. And that changes the dynamic of the entire scene for the actor and for the scene in general. Um, it, it, would you agree? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what you're what you're trying to avoid is what we call result directing. Yes. I want you to be happier here. I want you to be <laughs> better. I want you to be faster or funnier. Uh, all those god awful things. Or how about this one? OK, let's do this with a lot of energy and give it a lot of heart. 
<laughs> you know, the actor thinks, right. thinks, this guy doesn't know what the crap's going on here. He doesn't right. have a clue. But, you know, you give them a good verb, and they're going, great, I can play that. That'll be fun to play. That's another thing that you're looking for, giving them goals that are fun to play, you know, th- th- that uh, are, are interesting that way. But you don't want to be giving them result directions or uh, faster, funnier, those kind of those kind of things. Yeah, you know, Mr. Can't, Mr. You, can't you cry? Can't you cry in this scene? <laughs> How about blubbering? Uh I remember uh, seeing uh, a behind the scenes documentary of uh, Star Wars where Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford, they all said there was only two directions that George Lucas gave faster and more intense. Those are the only two things he said on the set for their performances, faster, more intense. <laughs> that well, was... uh, yeah, it, it, it happens. And so you realize, okay, I guess we're pretty much in charge of ourselves here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but he and and he, actors like that. Actors like Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford, you know, are so good and so experienced that they can internalize those directions, and yeah. they'll give you something organic. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not just mechanically becoming a robotic of going faster or and speaking louder or harder. I'm I'm more intense. Says how's this? You know, which is yeah. totally un- unorganic and reads as fake. Right, and that's where those bad performances come in. Now, how do you give constructive notes on a performance, uh, which I always find is kind of like a tightrope because you want to give the, a direct. Uh, you don't, you don't want to walk up to the actor and go, "That sucked." This is really how you really should go about it. Like, how do you approach that conversation if they're completely off the reservation on where you want them to go? You know what? Going up to them and trying an idea of where you'd like them to go. Selling it as a pitch is okay. always gonna is always gonna work. And you you go up to uh, to an actor and and you say, you know, it's interesting. You were trying to you know, I felt you were trying to persuade him here. Uh, but but what would it what would it be like if if you were trying to seduce him? What would that be like? So so notice, I have not said when you tried that persuading stuff, it sucked. Mm-hmm. What I said was, what would happen if we tried it this way? Uh, how would it be if we did, you know, if if we, uh, what would happen if you grab hold of her in the middle of the scene and just kiss her, you know, find find a moment that that might work. What would would that work? You think? And the actor goes, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me try it. Let me try it. So so we're not necessarily criticizing because. That, that's not our business. Our business is we're there playing with stuff. We're trying different things, mm-hmm. uh, and and we're we're trying not to be judgmental about it, because you know actors, no matter how tough they they may act, they you know they're very sensitive people, and and you don't want to be bullshitting them. So you're saying, okay, we're here, we're here in the playground. We're playing. Let's try it this way. What, what would happen if? And, and notice again, I'm not giving orders. I'm asking questions. That's great advice. That's really, really great advice. Which leads me to my next question. How do you relax a nervous actor? Because a nervous actor is, 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 is like having a skittish cat on set. Uh, <laughs> you need to relax them. How do you relax them? Boy, uh, that's that's tough. I think I think sometimes if if you've got a, a a slightly got a little bit of time, you know, to to take a break and say, hey, come on over with me over to craft service. Mm-hmm. Uh, you want you want some coffee or you know you feel like some you know a coke or something, and go over and just be talking to them about everything but the scene. Talk about how was your morning? You know how how did you how did you get along? I I heard you guys got a new dog. Uh, you know how's that going? Is he house trained yet? Uh, isn't that the bitch when they poop all over your you know <laughs> all your shoes in the dining room? You're having dinner, so you talk about everything except the scene, and 
uh, first of all, it kind of helps them see that you're not freaking out about about it. Um, you, ha you have a chance. I've taken actors out and, you know, let's walk around the soundstage here. Go outside and, you know, take a, take a breath of fresh air and let's not talk about the scene. Uh, let's go back in. You know, it, it takes a bit for them to relax to get all that stress out because it's building up like crazy inside of them. And if they're frustrated about what they're doing, uh, I, I mean, you can you can always go up to the actor and say, "Now, what what are you playing here? What what's what's your goal here? What what do you think is is going going on here? What what do you want out of this scene? You know, that's that's always that's always something you can go back to at the, the beginning and say, you know, let's focus again on what the scenes." about uh, that help that that can be very very helpful uh, just to remind them of their their goals and their objectives and uh and what the obstacle is the obstacle is maybe the other character you know dad can i can i borrow the car tonight i'm going no you had the car twice this week you mm -hmm. know dad becomes the obstacle and you know how do you feel about it? Do you totally disrespect dad or do you think dad is cool and you'll listen to him or, you know, what do you feel about him? So, so they, these are kind of questions you can, you can always be asking, uh, asking the actor, you know, what their goal is and what the obstacle is and how would you solve this? How, how would you get dad to give you the keys? You know, make him, make him laugh. Can you, can you make your goal? Let's 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 see if we can get Dad tickled, and make him laugh. How about that? Now, do you uh, t do you give that direction to one actor and not let the other actor know that it's coming? Oh yeah, you can. You absolutely. You want to want to kind of keep them keep them fresh like that. Sometimes you can give them opposing things. Elia Kazan was famous <laughs> yeah. for giving actors opposing goals. And in and in in one scene in a play called Dark at the Top of the Stairs, uh, girlfriend of the boy who lives in the house comes in, and she's got a coat on. And the mother of the boyfriend comes over and takes her coat and hangs it up for her. So Kazan Kazan goes to the mother and says, "Now take the coat off and hang it up." Then he goes to the girlfriend and says, "Do not let her have the coat." <laughs> And and action, <laughs> and action, and 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 what happens? You know, they don't know what each other, what's going on with each other, but you know, one is thinking this little bitch is trying to screw with me. <laughs> God damn it! You know, and suddenly he gets a little bit of a hate relationship going. I mean, it's really tricky stuff to try that. You, it'll backfire on you like crazy. Yeah. Uh, it used to backfire on Kazan all the time. But, you know, when it worked, it was fabulous. You know, you'd get these weird moments between actors. Right. And they're just like, what's what's going on? <laughs> yeah, that's actually really great. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, we, you want that's an authentic, uh, authentic performance, if you will, that is not acting. It's reacting in many ways. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, reacting. Uh, Gary Cooper used to say. I'm not a very good actor, but I'm a great listener. <laughs> and so, so when you're when you're listening in a scene, you're not just standing there waiting for your cue line, and thinking, "Okay, now what do I say? Okay, what do I do?" No, you've got to be listening, actively listening, and uh, you know, finding a way that you're giving something back to the other, the other actor, responding to them. Now. How do you deal with an overconfident actor? Someone who thinks that they know everything and they don't want to listen to you. And how do you deal with an overconfident actor? I guess it depends on, on, on what, they're, what they're doing. Um, you know, the overconfidence might be a, 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 a cover-up for lack of confidence, you know, that they're, they're coming in. But, you know, you got to give them room to hang themselves. And... <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, let them, let them try. Um, 
uh, my experience with, with Frank Langella in mm. the Dracula film I did with him years ago was when we got to doing on film one scene that was almost a, a duplicate of what he had done on Broadway in the play of Dracula. Mm -hmm. he, he was acting suddenly at a scale that was bigger than Mount Rushmore. And, uh, right. and it just, it was not going to work on, on film. And, and I, you know, I, I was trying to bring him down, uh, and, and get to a, a more manageable film scale, but he was just totally convinced that that's the way it had to go. So eventually I wound up saying to him, tell you what, when, when this film comes back from the London labs, we were in the south of, in the south of England in Cornwall, when it comes back, come to Daly's and look at it with me. And if you like it, I'll shut up. I'll never say anything again. Uh, but if you don't like it, we have a chance we can redo this at some point. And so he shows up in dailies and the scene comes up and he watches for, a, you know, a couple of minutes. And then I hear, oh, my dear God. <laughs> and, and there you go. And, you know, he sees he sees that the, that the, the the kind of directing that was great on Broadway was over the top on film. Mm -hmm. And and so. Several weeks later, when we were on a sound stage, we had built, rebuilt the set, and we did it again. It's one of the best scenes in the movie. It's a big face-off with Laurence Olivier, and the two of them are out acting each other all over the place, but in a way that works so powerfully on film. I mean, there's Olivier in his 70s, ill with cancer, almost, you know, barely propped up. And he's, you know, out acting Langella like crazy. And, you know, Frank is realizing he's got to really step up to the mark here because he's against, you know, a, a total master of, of, of film acting. How was it? How was it working with Lawrence Olivier? I mean, that's not a sentence I generally ask people. <laughs> what a what a cool experience. You know, that man knew more about acting and, and directing than I will ever know and understood my problems. So even when we had a couple of little disagreements here and there, he, he would say, well, I'm, I'm only doing this because I don't want to embarrass you in front of the crew, but I don't believe this is the right way to do it. And so I could, I could get the hit and I'd say, well, go ahead and do it the way you want to do it. What you think is right. Um, and uh, because, you know, the, I, I said to him, you know, the first person I ever saw in the movies was when I was five years old and my mother took me to see Henry V, mm -hmm. directed by you know who and starring you know who. <laughs> right. So it's really tough for me, you know, to, to, to work with you and call you Larry <laughs> when I really want to say, yes, sir, Lord, Lord Olivier. Yeah, how young were you? You were in your you were you in your twenties, or because I was early in your career. I was in like late thirties. Well, really, oh, really? So you had already been directing a bunch, of, but still, it's still Lawrence Olivia. I mean, you could have been fifty and still I, Lawrence oh, Olivia. Oh, exactly, exactly. What a trip! <laughs> what a trip! And and you know, such a an amazing professional and un, never uh, never a diva. You know, always totally there for for what, what we needed to do, mm -hmm. and phys physically, you know, he was always the bravest physical actor on the on the English stage, and and even in his seventies, a, a bit frail. If there was a you know a chase or running or things, he wanted to do it. That's awesome. He, he could do it. it. No, no, don't don't send my double in here. I can do it. I can do it. He was right. the, he was the Tom Cruise of his day. <laughs> I was, yes. Oh boy. Now I wanted to throw a scenario at you. I, I was actually talking to a director the other day who called me about a problem they were having on set, and they were like, "Look, I have I'm, I'm directing a you know a few million dollar movie, and my lead just got off of a big studio project, and he's a young young actor, like you know probably in his early twenties." but he was like the third banana or the fourth banana in a big studio, big monster film, 
you know, with a very big movie star who will remain nameless. In that, in that, uh, in that big studio movie, that movie star, he started to idolize how that movie star did everything. So they would, he would like, whatever that movie star did, he started taking notes and he started acting like that movie star on this one or two million dollar film saying that he, I can't, I, I'm never going to allow myself to be shot sitting down because this movie star doesn't allow that to happen. And he does, and this movie star doesn't do this, so I'm not going to do that. So he started doing all these things, but yet he's never done anything. He's not a movie star. Uh, nobody knows who he is. But since he played the second or third banana, <laughs> in this, his ego was out of control. How do you deal with that? If this is your lead and the reason for the financing of the film, how do you handle that situation in your opinion? Wow. Uh, <laughs> that, that's a, that is a tough one. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then, by the way, the for actor sure. did, the actor did uh, really love the director. So there, there was a good relationship there, but yet he stood firm on certain things that he wouldn't do because this other movie star wouldn't do them. So there's that a little bit more information. Wow. Wow. Boy. <laughs> I, I, that's a stumper, uh, <laughs> how to, you know, how to best to deal with that because you've got somebody coming in who believes he's right so desperately because he's, he, he watched somebody use those techniques mm-hmm. and, and admired how they, how they worked and, um, and, and yet not taking into consideration that one person could get away with it because he was, you know, a movie star. The, the Lawrence Olivier of his time. <laughs> right. And, you know, could be difficult. Not that Olivier ever was. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, now 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 you've got this punk. Uh, that's the only way to classify it. Pretty much. Punk coming in, coming in like that. And, um I don't. I don't know. Um, I, th- I think you have to have some some conversations in 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 the motorhome <laughs> about you know uh, how how uh, how we're gonna how we're gonna deal with this so that you don't have these conversations in public. That's at least one of the first things I would do because when you have them in public, people feel you know honor bound to maintain that position. And you know, to the death, mm-hmm. and uh, they they have an they have an audience. So when these things come up uh, in front in front of the crew, the first thing you got to do is, you know, get get them out of there and and get them in, in a place where you can have the conversation and uh, and talk to them about you know tell me you know tell me why you think that you wouldn't get shot sitting down. How does that work? You know, talk to me. Talk to me about that. Uh, and uh, and see if see if you can think out of, of you know good good argument. But but definitely you you have to hear them out. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. Uh, you have to hear them out. It has to be in private, where you can you can listen to them and and listen to their listen to their opinions. And then they may be willing to listen to you, the problems that you have in allowing them to do this. You know, why sh- shooting them uh, sitting down is <laughs> right. You know, is is not a good is not a good idea. And why you have to be standing up? I, I take it that's what he wanted to do. The, the other always, way, he always wanted to be standing up. He never wanted to be shot in a position of not powerful or not heroic. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> always, always doing that. Oh my God. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> after the show is over, I'll tell you who the star he was emulating is. But. Um, but you know, like that's a difficult scenario. And the, by the way, this director yeah. it was his, it was uh, the second film that he had been doing, so he's still just getting off the ground himself. So he really didn't have a lot of you know experience to kind of fall back on, or or you know a filmography or anything that he could fall back on to just go look, man. I've done this for a while. This is just the way it's going to be. <laughs> well, yeah, <clears throat> and and if you're you know, one of one of our great 
directors, they, you know, they're, the intimidation factor precedes them. Right. And they don't have to do anything. But somebody more beginning, and I can remember back to those days with me, where you're constantly having to prove yourself and, you know, an arrogant or a very strong minded actor is going to try to walk all over you. And that's that that's really tough, tough to deal with. But uh, listening, listening to them and, you know, getting getting them to be able to articulate their points of view uh, and so on is a start on how, how you're going to how you're going to do that. But do you do you feel that a lot of this is just fear and insecurity? I mean, when you have an actor who's doing that, it's just coming from fear and insecurity. And if you can address that, you might be able to break through. Right, right. Yeah, of course, of course it is. It's a very defensive thing. It's, you know, here's, here's a way I can get through my life. I've seen a guy who can do it a certain way and is really cool when he does it this way. So I'm going to emulate that. And now I have to defend that position at the same time. And I get very defensive about it. Um, so the the first bad thing I could do is come in and say, "No, no, 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 no. <clears throat> you don't want to. Do, you don't want to do that." Uh, I I had uh, you. You may have heard me tell this story with uh, uh, worked with Goldie Hawn mm-hmm. on a movie called Bird, Bird on the Wire. Sure, Mel Gibson and, Bert, and, and Goldie, yeah. And there's a scene where she and Mel Gibson, when they were boyfriend and girlfriend years ago, were riding on a roller coaster. And she thinks back to that. She tells me on the day that we're lining up the roller coaster shot, (laughs) she hates roller coasters. You know, she's only been working with us on the picture for four months. But now she picks the day to tell me she doesn't like roller coasters and, you know, she doesn't want to do it. Right. And we shoot something else that day. And I'm going, well, this is half our day's work uh, today. Uh, and and so uh, I, I was saying, well, tell me more about this. You know, why why are you afraid? Um, and and how does this bother you? And I let her let her talk about it. And I said, the one thing I I think that the roller coaster does for us is it helps show the relationship between these when they were boyfriend and girlfriend and in a relationship and how much fun they were having. So, uh, what would you think? What would you think about this Goldie? What would you think if we took the roller coaster when it rolls into the station and stops, you know where that is, right? Yes, I know. Well, what if we could back that roller coaster up about 50 or a hundred feet and have you be in it and it just rolls into the station and you just, you know, act your ass off being delighted and gleeful Mm -hmm. and, and we can use that. And, and, and otherwise I can, I can use your, your photo double Dawn and, and, and she can hide her face and we'll get by with it. She said, well, I can do that. I can do it. Just do a hundred feet, roll in. Absolutely. That's all we have to do. And she gets into there and we, we get the cameras lined up and she's sitting in kind of Mel Gibson's lap mm-hmm. in the front car of the roller coaster, start the cameras. It comes rolling in, boom, it's all done. And, and I'm running over while the guys are checking the cameras to make sure they rolled. And I hear Mel talking to her and he's saying, well, that was nothing. She said, that's all there is. I mean, that, that was the thing. He said, yeah, it's no big deal. And I suddenly went, Oh my God. Okay. Quick. I, I, I motioned to the camera guys, get away from the camera. I roll the camera, roll the camera. And I waved to the guy who ran the roller coaster, start the roller coaster, go, go, go. And it just took off with them in it. <laughs> you had cam- I'm assuming you had a camera in there ca- covering it. Oh yeah. We had, we had two cameras on it covering it and it goes up and around. I'm going, I, I am in such trouble if, if she, <laughs> it didn't have a good time like this. I am so screwed. I can't believe it. But I had to just go for it. And it comes rolling back around about two minutes later. And her eyes are as big as saucers. <laughs> and and she's laughing and cackling and 
carrying oh. on and say, oh, that was great. I love that. And I'm going, oh, thank God. Uh, <laughs> and thank God the camera rolled and I'm not fired. <laughs> <laughs> that could have turned uh, that could have turned ugly very quickly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes you just have to pull tricks out, you know, and take your opportunity and 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 kind of trick people into it and hope to hell that it doesn't, you know, blow back on you. Yeah, there's that one scene that just reminded me of like do, telling an actor one thing and doing another, which is generally not something you want to do. Um, but in the end scene of Die Hard, when Hans Gruber is being dropped from the um, the building, that close up, sh- that like kind of iconic close up mm-hmm. shot, the look on his face of fear is because the stunt guy is like, "Oh, we're gonna go on three. and he goes one, and he let go, and he wasn't expecting it, and that fear on his face was actual fear. <laughs> Oh my gosh! <laughs> and it, but it was a great. That's why it looks so great. But you generally don't want to do is. that. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> Fabulous now, looking, yeah. Now, I, what is? How do you balance knowing what you want but still being open to ideas? Because uh, I find that a lot of directors, when I work with them, they. They, they come in, guns are blaring, I know everything, blah, 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 blah. So you have to have a sense of confidence of that you are in control, but yet you still have to be open to ideas and collaboration because that's what the filmmaking process is. So what's your, what's your take on that? My feeling is that you have to be prepared. Mm-hmm. You have to be as prepared as you possibly can uh, with answering every question and assuming that you have no help but yourself, that, that people just barely can do it. Now, as you, as you approach the set, you have to say, wait a second, this DP, I hired the best DP I could find, and, I, and he hired the best grip and, and gaffer, and, and we've got these great makeup people. Let's see what they bring us. Let's, let's, be, let's be open to, to that and see how it works with, with what I'm doing so that we wind up with a blend. If nobody's got any ideas, I know exactly how to do it that I think will work, but I really want to hear what the, what the other people are doing. So I will, I will turn to camera operators, for example. As, as I'm staging a scene, usually the default position of a camera operator when the director's staging a scene is over sitting, checking their iPod, uh, their iPhone for emails, right. you know, and seeing if they've got a date that night with their girlfriend. But I, I say, no, you guys have to stand over here and watch me stage these scenes. And I'm going to ask you when we finished how we're going to shoot it. And you're going to tell me. Uh, so, so be, be ready with an answer. Uh, so I make them I make them watch and I make them contribute. Well, I think we could go over here and we could do this and I think we could do this. And so what we wind up with is maybe a blending of, of ideas or trying a couple of different approaches to things. But I really make people come in and collaborate with me. And they're used to working a lot in situations where they just sit back and wait to be told what to do, mm-hmm. which is the worst use of creative people. You know, these these people, you know, I'm a camera operator, but that means I got here because I've got a very creative sense of, you know, how to how to work with this piece of machinery. And, uh, you know, I don't I don't want to be stuck into just a robotic operator of, right. of a piece of hardware. I want to be able to, you know, contribute an idea. So if they know that I'm open to it, they're going to be more open to it. So I, I get great suggestions that way. Now, I have to ask you, in your entire career, is there a scene, is there a moment that you consider like, this, is, this was just magic, this was uh, amazing, this, was, this is my favorite acting, favorite scene that I directed very, like, what is that thing in, in, in your filmography that you still can remember to this day? You know, you're going to think this one is crazy. Go but- for it. We talked about short circuit yeah. a little while, yeah. while, while ago, uh-huh. and, I'm, and I'm thinking, I've got a scene in there where Ali Sheedy is dancing with number five, 
Yeah, I remember. Robot. I remember it. And 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 they're going to how deep is your love? Uh, <laughs> and and here she is with this huge unwieldy robot, and they're turning each other around. The robot is dipping her. I mean, we're doing crazy stuff here. And the and the uh, the playback is going with the BG singing "How Deep Is Your Love." I mean, it was just it was so magical because it was so silly, right. and and yet it was the kind of thing you can do in movies that, you know, just is the sense of magic that this big screwed together TV prop or movie prop of number five, right. you know, could actually be doing this this wonderful romantic dip and dance that uh, so. I remember standing there as we're going through the takes, just completely almost crying. (laughs) You're like, this is just a piece of machinery. (laughs) It's just so nuts. And that's the one that sticks out out of all the film, out of all the stuff you've done. That's the one that's like, you know what? That dancing scene with Johnny five. (laughs) That's awesome. I I mean, there, I'm sure there. I'm sure there's plenty of others, but uh, you know, the first one that pops up in your head is that you go, "Wow, well, that means something," I guess. Yeah, you know, and I, 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 I mean, obviously, a movie like Short Circuit would never be made in today's studio system. Um, most of the films in the past that you've directed would not be made in the studio system, uh, and that's generally for any film made in the '80s. Almost <laughs> would it be made? Right in the studio system i mean do you as a as a creator who's been around for so long i mean do you find that it's kind of sad that there's there's no as much risk taking uh in films i think there is more in television but in films like short circuit um stake out um you know those kind of films uh, war games these kind of films that would just not be made in today's world. And now they're going back to reboot it like Gremlins and the Goonies and, and all of these. Like, that would never get made in today's world. And I think we're a lesser society for it. I think we, we should be doing stuff like that in the studio system. What do you, what's your feeling on it, seeing how it's changed so much? Well, I have to look forward to what we can be doing going forward mm-hmm. and not, not worrying about what we can't do anymore. <laughs> okay. And I am seeing, you know, this opening up of of streaming and, and yeah. you know, television and video and so on, where so many things are getting made that have their own magic and their own special thing to them right. that would not be would not be made in the theatrical system because it's hard to get people off their butts and out to the out to the theater. You know, the people that like to go, the young people. Uh, because they want to get out of the house. They don't want to be stuck in the place. And and older audiences tend to, uh, you know, not not be so flexible about that. Uh, so, uh, so, so we're paying attention to that. We're seeing, you know, so many places, you know, not just the three networks, but now suddenly all these different channels. Now we've got we've got Netflix and we've got Hulu and we've got this. And Apple Plus and Disney Plus and Google Plus and, you know, every, everything is plus. Uh, <laughs> so, so there's so many possible places that you can, you can take material now that it's possible to, to make that I don't, I don't think uh, they, television would have made years ago. But now they're much more open to much, uh, much more edgy stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, watching watching the two versions of Catherine the Great that have been on recently, you mm-hmm. know, one that's a complete romp and one that's very serious. I mean, I I can't imagine those being made as a movie uh, nowadays, though back in, you know, back in the 70s and so on. Uh, yes, they would have made the serious version, I mm-hmm. suppose. Right. Exactly. Um, now, what are you up to next? What What are you working on now? Well, we're just we're just getting a book ready to come out. Uh, about four or five years ago, we published John Batam on directing. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, now we're doing the second edition, which is so much more about uh, surviving television. How directors can survive the the landmines and the political minefields <laughs> right. that is is television. Uh, 
it's such a different setup from directing feature films where you may be toward the top of the food chain, you as the director. But now in, in the world of streaming, you're way down the food chain. Uh, it's really tough for, for a director who finds themselves constantly about to be run over by so many people who are in charge here and there. And how do you survive this? Because if you don't survive, you know, you're going to lose the way you make your living. Uh, not just not be able to do creative work, but, you know, that's how you, that's how you make your living. And, and you have to re-gear your brain to see how you can survive and navigate through these really troubled, difficult waters of, of working in streaming media. And and that is where the majority. I mean, there's a lot more opportunity in streaming and television than there is in feature work uh, nowadays. Oh, God. That's wonder. That's what's wonderful about it. I mean, instead of there just being fifteen or twenty dramatic shows a week, now there are hundreds of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell my students at Chapman that I know we all want to make feature films. But I bet that most of us are going to start making our living, you know, in in a smaller medium. We may be we may be doing uh, quibbies or music videos or uh, things for YouTube, things like that. There's great respectability in doing all of that, mm -hmm. and it's creative work. Uh, so you don't want to turn up your nose because that's how you're going to you're you're going to survive and and make a living as a director. If you're going to be snobby about it, you may never work. <laughs> very true, very very true. So, now, what advice would uh, you give? What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Thank God we have the kind of equipment that we have, where people are shooting films on their iPhones. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's amazing the quality that you can get on on iPhones, even of a couple of generations ago. And, and I'm seeing what my students are shooting when they're going out. No longer are they going over to the gold room and getting, you know, some a Sony prosumer camera. They're doing it on the iPhones, and it's coming out really nicely. Um, and if they get a little bit of good equipment like decent microphones, then the quality just shoots up tremendously, usually the, the part where we're – where sound is involved gets gets the least respect. Uh, the, the visual always gets the strong respect. Anyway, the point being, you can make films that you can show to people. People that want to, you know, are, are entitled to say to you, let me see something you've done. Let me look at, you know, what's a, what's a, a short film or a short reel that you have. Uh, and, and that you can do not having to be in film school. You can do it on your own. And and it's a much more uh, entrepreneurial type of business than, than it used to be, where when you were shooting 16 millimeter film and stuff like that, it was so bloody expensive that only a few people mm -hmm. could even afford to buy the film stock. Uh, but, but nowadays, almost anybody can make a pretty decent looking film and give you a sense of this person knows how to tell a story. That's what we want to see. Can we tell a story? Not can we shoot a cool angle? Uh, <laughs> right. You know, not have we got a wacky lens here, uh, but can they tell a story? Can they uh, show us a character? That's, now, that ultimately, ultimately is always going to be the most important thing. I mean, the thing that got Spielberg started is the famous Amblin. The mm -hmm. film that he made uh, for next to no money. You looked at it and you knew it had been made for 25 cents. But he told a story with characters that you loved and, and it broke your heart by the end. And that was all it took to get him going versus so many of the films that were being made by students at the time that you couldn't make heads or tails of. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Never be sarcastic. <laughs> I love. I love to be sarcastic. 
it's so much fun. You have you get this silly idea and you just say it. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly there's blowback and you're in such trouble. Because <laughs> people Good. take it wrong, you know. They didn't want to hear that. And and it it's it's one of my biggest faults. I've gotten in trouble more times from that. So I, I keep lecturing myself, don't be sarcastic. Don't That's- do that. That's amazing. Um, Now, what was the biggest fear you had to overcome to make your first film? Well, I had been I had been making episodic television and television movies for four or five years at that point. But there was always this feeling of like, now I'm stepping into the bigger leagues. is it going to look like I'm just still shooting a little hour television show? Is it going to not have the scope, uh, the size of the storytelling? That was the big worry that I had. Uh, and, you know, it's always it's always a worry to, you know, are you going to tell the story well or not? And I think that every day, even as, as I go to the set now and I'm driving to the set in the morning, I'm scared to death that how it's going to go today. You know, is this scene going to work? Do I even know what I'm doing? You know, I'm constantly worried. And I tell myself, you know, if I weren't worried, maybe I shouldn't even be going to work. Good, good advice. And three of your favorite films of all time. Wow. Uh, I don't know what, what the third one is third one would be but uh i know that no country for old men oh, is so a good. constant favorite of mine citizen kane i can always watch mm-hmm. i can watch the godfather till the cows come home mm-hmm. you know that's i mean i i don't know what it is about it but you know if it is on television and i happen to flick past it, i say oh well, i like this scene let me watch a a minute or so of it. <laughs> right. Two hours later. <laughs> You're in part two. <laughs> I'm hanging it up and I say, Francis, thank you. God bless you for making this film. <laughs> and where can people find uh, find you and, and, and buy the book? And and they can, they'll be able to buy it on Amazon mm-hmm. uh, easily or Michael Weesey Productions, which is also sells the book. But uh, Amazon is is the the quick place to go. And where's your other book that you have that uh, which is fantastic the other, as well? The other book, the other book is uh, is called "I'll Be in My Trailer," <laughs> and and it again talks about dealing dealing with actors and how how I managed to com- almost completely screw up uh, the last couple of weeks of Saturday Night Fever by getting into a a stupid argument with John Travolta that I didn't have to get into. Uh, And, and he turns and looks at me and says, I'll be in my trailer and heads off to his trailer. Well, we're standing on the Verrazano bridge at two in the morning and he's refusing to come out to shoot all because of, you know, something stupid that I did. And a lot of the book is, uh, you know, about, what could I have done better so I never had to have this problem in the first place? Excellent. Not his, not his fault. Right. Well, I, John, I recommend everyone pick up both of your books. I loved the first version of On Directing, and I'm looking forward to reading the second one as well. Uh, it is always a pleasure having you on the show, sir. Um, I am, as you know, a very, very big fan of your work and, and the continued work that you're doing with education at Chapman and with, through your book. So thank you again so much for being on the show.